Good evening, I'm Kelly Gear Rifkin, National Chair of a Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicines and Women's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Conversations That Matter. You know, a woman's journey strives to improve your well being through health education. Did you know, according to the American Heart Association research, stroke is the second leading cause of death worldwide? In the United States, stroke was the third leading cause of death in women compared with fifth in men. In total, approximately 55,000 more fatal strokes occur in women each year than in men. Tonight, we are joined by neurologist Dr. Elizabeth Marsh, who serves as medical director of the Comprehensive Stroke Program at the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. So please use your Q&A on your screen to ask your questions, and the doctor will respond to them after her 20-minute session of our conversation. And tonight the webcast will conclude at 8 p.m. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for the production assistance. And you can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Marsh. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to talking with you tonight a little bit about stroke and particularly about the diagnosis, the management and the recovery, thinking about uh, factors that affect women. Uh, Like Kelly said, I'm uh, Liz Marsh and I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins. Uh, My lab actually focuses on post-stroke cognition and post-stroke recovery, and uh, I'm I'm very grateful to the NIH, uh, as well as some grateful patients, uh, for uh, enabling me to do the work that I do. There we go. So tonight I want to take a a few minutes first to talk about really the global impact of stroke. Uh, Kelly started to allude to this uh, about uh, just how prevalent stroke is uh, and how really uh, there's many opportunities uh, from the prevention level at at helping to prevent the signs and symptoms uh, that lead us to to this devastating disease that that results in the need for recovery. But then I want to get into some of the sex-specific differences and talk a little bit about those etiologies of stroke that really affect women more than they affect men and how we might think about prevention in these groups. Uh, Then I want to move into the uh, prevention and management and talk a little bit about some of the issues like hormone replacement therapy uh, and other risk factors that uh, women are more prone to. And then finally, I want to end by talking a little bit about recovery and some of the issues that affect women uh, and that I think about in my practice. So let's start with the impact of ischemic disease. Uh, Like we were saying earlier, stroke is really common and it's debilitating. Uh, It affects nearly 800,000 people in the United States every year. And and while we've moved down, we're now the fifth leading cause of death in the the United States. Uh, We were the fourth, so it's a good good way, a good direction to be going in. It's still the leading cause of long-term morbidity because the deficits that it leads uh, can really impact people's lives. And it results in a lot of money in healthcare expenditures, lost wages and cost. And why is that? Well, it's because the risk factors are so common in our population, high blood pressure and diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking. And as we get older, atrial fibrillation, things that people commonly have as they get older in medicine are are the major risk factors for stroke. And that's whether you're a woman or a man. So surprisingly, stroke isn't more common in men. I know we might think that, but actually over 50% of strokes occur in women. So 3.8 million women will be living in the United States currently with a stroke as opposed to 3 million men, still high numbers on both counts. And there's two types of stroke. There's the blood clot where it blocks a blood vessel and no blood gets to the brain. That's called an ischemic stroke. And then there's a type of stroke where the blood vessel bursts and there's a hemorrhage in the brain, a hemorrhagic stroke. And both of these types, while hemorrhagic stroke is more rare, the rates between men and women are, are similar. Women do tend to be older when they have their strokes. We know that women often outlive men. Um, And this may be one of the reasons why they're actually more likely to die of a stroke, uh, but not necessarily in the hospital. It was mentioned earlier that, that it is the third leading cause of death in women. So to set the stage, I wanna talk a little bit about acute treatment of stroke and then how this uh, actually impacts women and and some of the things that we think about. 
So up until 1995, we didn't have amazing treatments and the field has really taken off. So in 1995, something called tissue plasminogen activator or TPA uh, became FDA approved. It's the clot buster. So when you have a clog in your, in your sink and you pour Drano in and it breaks up the clot, that's what TPA does to the blood clots in your blood vessels. It's given through an IV um, and, and it really dramatically changed uh, the, the landscape of how people recovered from stroke. That was back in 1995, so not that long ago. But it took us about 20 years until 2015 when four or five uh, landmark studies came out that showed that we could really do better. So besides giving this, this clot buster TPA, now what we do is for big strokes, we actually take a catheter, just like when someone has a heart attack, and we insert it through the groin and go all the way up but bypass the heart and go right to the brain. And with this little, it almost looks like a ship in a bottle where you deploy and you can pull, uh, get the, the, the clot in the, uh, uh, in the little mesh and you pull it out. You can actually remove big clots from the brain. So this is, is called a mechanical thrombectomy. And in combination with IV TPA, with the clot buster, it's really revolutionized stroke care. And people are now dealing with much smaller strokes and having much better recoveries. In fact, when we look at this, this is a, a, something called the modified Rankin scale, how we grade scale uh, people's strokes after uh, they have an infarct. Zero is no symptoms. It's what we want. And unfortunately, five is bed bound. And you can see that... Uh, People that don't get thrombectomy or the controls um, have are much more likely to be up here in this bad range than people who got the intervention. There's a lot more of these zeros and ones and twos. So these interventions really help to put people down at, at smaller strokes, less severe, better recoveries. So what does that mean for women? Well, I'll tell you that these treatments themselves don't discriminate. They, they do as well for women as they do for men. However, what we found in studies is that women actually come to the emergency department late, often. And the problem is, is, is that you can really only give some of these treatments early in the course, because as the brain uh, infarcts, there's a risk for bleeding when you give these treatments. So we want people to be seen in the emergency room and given these, this IV TPA within four and a half hours of having their symptoms. And oftentimes women come in too late. There's many possible reasons for that, but one of them in, in asking is a lack of knowledge about TPA. So one study asked women what they knew about TPA, and a lot of them had heard of it, but didn't realize that there was a time window and that it was really important for them to come early, especially among women of color. Uh, so it tells us that we really have an opportunity to get the word out, to say when there are stroke symptoms, you need to come right in and be seen because there's things that we can do. The other problem is, is that women and men are different and they often present with different symptoms. So while a man might present with weakness on one side or not being able to speak, sometimes women can have less typical symptoms, hiccups, or just saying that they're more tired. So by presenting differently, sometimes they're not taken seriously to begin with and a stroke's identified late, which means that they can't be treated or at least not treated as aggressively. So when we think about treatment, it's really important to come to come in in time and, and, and to let women know and let everyone know that, that if they start to have stroke symptoms, they need to come in and be seen. But it's also important to think about the different types of stroke that men and women may have so we can think about how to prevent it and how to treat it appropriately. So that's what I want to talk about next. So I want to be really clear that Far and away, the most common cause of stroke in women are the same causes in, uh, that affect men. It's vascular risk factors, right? It's those things we talked about to begin with. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, obesity. But what's important is, is that after menopause, these vascular risk factors really increase in women. So their stroke risk goes, goes up. So hypertension becomes much more prevalent uh, post-menopausal, and actually there's a higher risk of stroke associated with this blood pressure. Again, this gives us an opportunity to really make sure that we're controlling women's blood pressure to keep that stroke risk down. But unfortunately, studies have shown that while women are more likely to be on medicine for blood pressure, it doesn't mean that they're under good control. So following up with your primary care and making sure you're in that good range is really important. 
Obesity rates are higher in women and often after menopause. And atrial fibrillation, we talked about how women are often outliving men and getting older. Well, unfortunately, AFib is, is a disease of older people. So while it increases with age, more women are living longer and having atrial fibrillation. And that can absolutely be a stroke risk factor. So these are the common risk factors that we always want to think about. But what are some really sex-specific etiologies that may be uh, uh, fairly specific to women that we want to make sure we talk about? So the first one is something called a sinus venous thrombosis, or this is a blood clot, but rather than being in the arteries of the brain, which are the vessels that, that give blood to the brain, this affects the venous system. So the arteries give blood to the brain and the veins take it away. And you can see here this picture in the corner, how there's a, um, uh, how there's a nice big vein on this side, but it's missing on this side. And this is where the venous clot is. And what happens is, is if the brain can't drain the blood, it backs up. So kind of like when your toilet gets clogged and the pressure builds and builds and builds, you can imagine that's not healthy for the brain and it causes brain damage. So a different type of stroke. This type of stroke is actually the most prominent uh, for a sex difference, where 70% of the people that have sinus venous occlusions are actually women, and it's younger women in their 30s to 50s. And that may be because a lot of this is attributed to oral contraceptive use, particularly in women who are overweight and who smoke, and to pregnancy. Uh, so a really important thing to think about Oftentimes patients can present with a really bad headache that doesn't go away, and then they get neurologic symptoms, so weakness or trouble thinking or seeing or speaking. When that happens, it's not just a headache anymore, and you really have to be seen because there could be something underlying that's going on, like a sinus venous thrombosis. We talked a little bit about pregnancy and the risk for a venous clot for sinus venous thrombosis, but you know, pregnancy by itself can cause strokes, even the arterial kind. And part of that's because the body's you know, really magnificent. When you're pregnant, you don't want to bleed. So it makes your blood thick, right? It's not good to, to if you have a bleeding disorder when you're pregnant, you want to make sure that, that that doesn't happen. And when you're delivering, that there's not a lot of bleeding. But that increased thickness in blood uh, and these clotting factors that are upregulated during that time do put women in that peripartum period, so that last trimester of pregnancy and right after, mm -hmm. at a slightly higher risk of having a stroke. Uh, now, all these things that I'm going to tell you, I want you to take kind of in context that they're all building blocks, right? We all have these risk factors. I'm certainly not saying no, that someone shouldn't become pregnant. I'm just saying these are things to think about, right? In the same way that if you identify high blood pressure, you want to make sure that you're treating your pressure. And that if you're pregnant, you want to make sure you're taking care of yourself and you're eliminating other risk factors like smoking and other things that you can do for your health. The other uh, hypercoagulable or, or uh, condition that makes blood thick uh, can be the autoimmune diseases that are often more prevalent in women. And the most common is lupus, uh, which can result in, in antibodies, anti-cardiolipin antibodies, that again, make the blood thick and make strokes more likely. Another uh, 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 syndrome that is more common in women than men is, is a mouthful. It's something called reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, or it's RCVS for short, which is much easier. And it's another headache syndrome that happens where someone gets the worst headache of their life, a terrible headache. And what's happening is the blood vessels are clamping down and they're spasming. And that can result in little bleeds or in little strokes. Now that, again, doesn't mean that every headache that you have is potentially a stroke. A lot of people have headaches and that's okay. Uh, but these, again, headaches that are out of proportion, we call them a thunderclap. And especially if they have neurologic findings associated with them, then, then that's something that I think about. What puts someone at increased risk is being female. So we know it happens more commonly in women. It tends to happen in women in their 40s and 50s, and it tends to happen in women who have migraines and often uncontrolled migraines, so lots of migraines. Um, sometimes medications can precipitate, particularly the antidepressants. Um, again, that doesn't mean that if you're a woman with migraine, you shouldn't be on antidepressants. It just is, are things that we follow over time and think about uh, as, as we're making sure that you're staying healthy from a neurologic standpoint. 
I said that lots of women have migraine, lots of men have migraine, but certainly lots of women have migraine and that's okay, right? Not, not every headache is, is our CVS, uh, but aura by itself or aura meaning the, the neurologic symptoms that can sometimes come with a headache when you see spots or when you have a little bit of, of arm heaviness that accompanies your, your migraine headache. That's okay. That's not having a stroke that happens uh, with headaches and can absolutely happen with headaches. But what we know is in that group of individuals, that have migraine with aura when they have neurologic symptoms is, is that their stroke risk overall is slightly higher than the general population of people who either just have migraine or don't have migraine at all. And again, to me, what that uh, proposes is, is a modifiable risk. So I know that if you smoke and if you're overweight and have migraine with aura, that risk goes way up. So people that have migraine with aura, I'm really careful about making sure that all of the rest of their risk factors are well modified. We're going to talk about that a little bit in just a minute. From the women's health study, though, just as an example, migraine with aura, four additional cases per 10,000 women per year uh, had a stroke. It, uh, so migraine with aura, right, it's a small increase, but it's an increase nonetheless. And something to think about as you're talking to your healthcare provider and making sure your headaches are well controlled. I like to put this slide up as I talk about management and prevention of stroke, uh, not to say that breast cancer isn't important uh, uh, as, as a cause of, of, of death in women, because it absolutely is, but just to put it in perspective a little bit and to see how many women die from stroke every year. Uh, so certainly it's something that we want to make sure we're treating aggressively and thinking about because prevention really is, well, there's lots of wonderful treatments, the best thing to do uh, to help avoid it entirely. So when I think about different management strategies and prevention, the things that I think about that really are different between men and women in general are th really three flavors. One is, is carotid disease or large vessel disease, which we'll talk about in a second. Two is hormone therapy. And three is a little bit more about migraines, which we were talking about before. So one of the ways that you can get stroke is by having plaque build up in, in your big blood vessels. You have two big blood vessels in the front that go to the brain and two big blood vessels in the back. Um, just like your kitchen sink can over time get clogged um, with all the grit and the grime that you put down it, that kind of can happen in the blood vessels and you can have plaque build up. And what happens is that plaque can rupture cause a big clot and it can go to the brain. So pretend the brain's up here and this is a picture of the carotid and this is a, a nasty plaque. What we know is that, uh, is that women, um, uh, this happens less frequently than men. So it's more likely to happen in a man than in a woman, but both benefit from surgery uh, if this is found and if they've had a stroke. But what's interesting and important to think about is, is the relative risk of surgery. So women have smaller vessels overall, and surgery can be more complicated. So when I'm thinking about the risks and benefits of taking someone to surgery with a carotid plaque, and they happen to be a woman, I, I think about uh, that risk-benefit ratio differently than I do in men. Most of the time, we still proceed with surgery, but it's another piece of the conversation. So as we think about the best way to treat people, uh, sex definitely comes into play. And sometimes we'll opt for medical management as opposed to surgical management uh, based on that risk. Something else that's really important to think about when we think about management is oral contraceptives, um, both um, the oral contraceptive pills in younger women and hormone replacement therapy in older people. Uh, and this really, you know, has been looked at for a very long time. You see lots of studies that I've listed here. From you know the 1960s to the early 2000s, studies were, were showing fairly consistently that with oral contraceptive use, there was an increased risk of stroke. But then we had the women's health study that came out that was a really large cohort study in Sweden uh, from the 1990s to, to the early 2000s. And interestingly, it didn't find an association. So, so kind of what was going on and what's happening? I think this study from Denmark really did it best by trying to break it down into the level of hormone. So what we found out is that higher levels of estrogen can absolutely significantly increase your stroke risk. So it's not the progestin. Uh, we know that that, that that really doesn't increase stroke risk, but the higher levels of estrogen are, are certainly associated. The good news is, is that the low-dose pills don't seem to have nearly as much uh, increased stroke risk. Now, similar to migraine aura, 
the low dose pills still have a little bit of increased risk. And that's where it becomes a risk benefit discussion, right? So if somebody needs oral contraceptives, they, they have heavy periods, or they have a reason that they need to be on them, that's absolutely fine. The stroke risk relatively is quite low. But if you add to that person high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, obesity, then all of a sudden those things are starting to, to ramp up uh, your stroke risk overall. So it's another piece of risk to think about as you're, as you're thinking about the best way to help prevent a stroke. The same is true for hormone replacement therapy. So I told you that after menopause, the stroke risk is higher because there's a lot of vascular risk factors. But in noticing that, that made people think, huh, well, I wonder before we had all of this data on oral contraceptives, if hormones were actually good, and maybe we want to get hormones back to help decrease stroke risk. So there were two randomized controlled trials to actually look at this and say, hmm, if we get hormone replacement, can we, uh, can we actually protect the heart and the brain? And unfortunately, they found that this, that this just wasn't the case. And that similar to the oral contraceptive studies, hormone replacement therapy doesn't, uh, um, uh, some have shown that, that it may be, uh, again, slightly increase your risk for stroke, um, but it certainly doesn't, doesn't help it. So the bottom line is, is that we like low dose uh, estrogens uh, rather than higher dose, uh, but that we always have to weigh the risks and the benefits based on the symptoms people are having that require them to have hormone replacement therapy versus the rest of their overall health and the risk for stroke. And low is always better. So that kind of brings me to the, to the treatment uh, considerations for any risk factor. So for all of these things that I was talking about, migraine with aura, um, uh, hormone replacement therapy, the way I talk about them in my clinic is, is a risk factor just like any other, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, and they're all building blocks that kind of increase your risk step by step. So if we're going to go on hormone replacement therapy, or if we're going to go on oral contraceptives, it's about knocking down all of the rest of those risk factors so that we can minimize any other risks that you have and keep it as low as we possibly can. Um, there, um, uh, and, that, and that's really how um, oftentimes I'll put people on a small dose of an aspirin, uh, again, to kind of um, uh, take off some of that risk and think about other ways that they can reduce it further. I want to talk for just a minute about uncontrolled migraine. So I told you that it's a risk factor for our CVS and that we know that migraine with aura can increase your stroke risk in women. Um, and, and this is just some nice data that shows that. So it's a busy slide, but this, these are people that have headaches less than once a month, and these are more than once a week. So a lot of headaches over here and not as many over here. And you can see when we go to the ischemic stroke, the, the risk that it goes up from 0.8 to 1.3. Um, uh, and this migraine without aura and in migraine with aura 1.9 times versus 4.25. So people that are having more than weekly headache that have migraine with aura, their stroke risk is quadrupled compared to the general population. So if we can get that, that headache frequency down, we can make a huge impact on their stroke risk. It's really important. I want to end uh, or, or spend the rest of the time today talking a little bit about stroke recovery and about how that can be uh, different for women than men also. So unfortunately, studies have shown that, that women actually have less favorable functional outcomes after stroke. And that can be for lots of reasons, but some that have been listed is because they're more likely, um, because they're often older to be widowed or living alone prior, so doing well, and then they have a stroke and now they're not doing well anymore. Um, and that makes them, you know, overall less likely to achieve their independence in their activities of daily living. That's what ADLs stands for. And they're often less likely to be able to be discharged home safely because there either isn't somebody there or they're not able to take care of themselves. We're going to talk in just a minute too about how recovery uh, can really, or stroke can really affect people's mood and fatigue and how that can be really amplified in women as well. This study, though, shows that uh, when they looked at a large group, women were older and more likely to have diabetes, but less likely to have heart disease or smoke than men uh, that, that, that had strokes. Um, and that, uh, again, they were less likely to have uh, independence um, and they were more likely to report problems with things like thinking and energy. 
So we looked at this in my clinic uh, a couple of years ago, because like I said, I'm very interested in recovery and, and in looking at, at differences between men and women. So over a, just over a year, over a 14 month period, we looked at a hundred of our patients that returned to clinic about a month after their stroke. And we administered them this scale that asked the things that they were having trouble doing. You know, How hard is it for you to do these things, to climb stairs, to understand feelings of others? Uh, it's important to show that uh, um, on the uh, NIH stroke scale, which is a measure of stroke severity where points are really bad. So, you know, minor strokes are, are strokes around 3.9 to 4. It goes up to 20 or higher. Those are big strokes. So these patients had relatively minor stroke. We're doing relatively well. They were in their 60s and about half of them were women. And about 40% were on an antidepressant because that's really common to have depression after stroke. So what our study found is, is that unfortunately, despite these low severity strokes, these low NIH stroke scales, lots of patients reported a lot of problems on that behavior scale. So even though they looked pretty good and seemed to be doing well, they had a lot of problems doing common things and really reported a lot of depression and fatigue. And this wasn't, it didn't matter whether you were a man or a woman as far as how many of these problems you were having, but we definitely saw a sex difference with respect to, to energy level and fatigue. So part of what I wanted to do in my lab is, is understand the brain changes that may underlie this, uh, not only uh, for my patients in general, but in men versus women. So what we've been working on is something called uh, magnetoencephalography, which is kind of a cross between an MRI scan and an EEG that shows the brain waves. And it lets us see in real time where signal is going in the brain. And what we were able to do is we were able to take control patients, or uh, not patients, controls who didn't have a stroke, and we were able to put them in the scanner. And this is what a normal brain looks like, where there's information and crosstalk back and forth. And this is at the first visit. Um, look at what's happening with the stroke patients. And this doesn't matter whether they're men or women. They have far less connections. But over time, as they get better, the controls stay the same because they still haven't had a stroke, but the stroke patients start to, as they improve, look more like the, the controls. So they get some of this crosstalk back. So it shows how they're starting to recover. Now we were looking for sex differences to see if men recover differently than women with their brain activity. And so far though, we, we need to do some larger studies. We haven't seen any of those differences. So it looks like uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a, a big difference in, in the recovery from that way. But what we do know, like I was saying, is, is that there are some things that women certainly have a harder time with and both mood and fatigue, as well as this, this fuzziness and this thinking problem seems to be one of them. And because of that, we've actually designed two trials that are, that are looking at, at ways we can make this better, right? So if people are having trouble with concentration and mood and thinking, one of the things that we've been looking at is mindfulness. And mindfulness-based stress reduction is kind of a combination between meditation and yoga. And for lack of a better word, it exercises the parts of your brain that are important for both thinking as well as for um, uh, um, attention and, and, and those types of things. And what we did is we randomized people to this mindfulness versus a stroke support group where they just go and they're interacting with people. And the thought is, is can we exercise those parts of the brain that are needed to, uh, to combat some of this fatigue and exhaustion and, and the depression and the mood and the frontal lobe fields? Um, Mindfulness-based stress reduction, like I was saying, really dates back to ancient times. And it's great because it doesn't involve any medication. Uh, it's just sitting there and really training your brain to exercise these areas. It's actually gaining popularity to treat anxiety and depression. So we were hoping it was really going to work with stroke patients. It's already used actually in, in diabetes and migraine, and they've even used it in, in a small set of people with Alzheimer's disease. And believe it or not, the Buddhist monks, when they... Uh, uh, after they meditated for a significant period of time, they used an EEG and could show differences in the brain in those areas that affect stroke patients. So we thought maybe, maybe that this would be helpful.
So it's currently an ongoing trial um, and we've randomized 30 patients and they've undergone mindfulness versus stroke support group. Uh, and what we're doing is we're not only looking at them clinically, but we're, we're seeing whether their brain activity on MEG changes over time. But if this is effective, it may be a good way to really help particularly women with some of the, the issues that they have with recovery. The other possibility, something that we're looking at is stimulation. So remember those, those connections that I showed you that, that need to occur uh, and kind of the, the increased crosstalk across the brain. Well, what if we could stimulate the brain and help that to increase? Uh, and that's the possibility with, uh, with something called transcranial direct uh, stimulation uh, or TDCS. And what we're hoping to do is with TDCS, again, we stimulate this part of the brain, the frontal lobe that affects mood and energy, uh, as well as thinking and attention. And that's where because these cognitive networks are there. And we're working on stimulating this and seeing, uh, again, patients get better and if it changes their connectivity in the brain. So I think that this is a really great, this, these are just our outcomes, but this is a really great uh, illustration of how we're able to take something that we see in clinical practice uh, we're able to take something we see both on, on our, our written cognitive tests as well as within the brain itself, and we're able to design specific therapies that are meant to target this. And I'm really hopeful that in the future, that's going to be a great way to really target treatment specifically, not only to, to men versus women, but to the exact problem that patients with stroke are having. So I'm really excited about this work, and I think it will really make a big difference in stroke recovery. So to wrap up before I, I take questions from, from you all, um, I really just wanna to, to put a point on it that stroke is really common. And it's really important to, to remember that it can present def differently in women, but it's really important to be picked up right away because that's the best time to be able to treat it and to be able to make those strokes as small as possible because the small strokes really recover the best, although it still can be difficult. And while the same vascular risk factors are important in, in women, especially after menopause, there really are some spe sex specific differences too. So pay attention to those headaches. And certainly if there's any neurologic symptoms associated with them, it's important to, uh, it's important to have those checked out. But thinking about hypercoagulability and, and times particularly like pregnancy, where that may be an issue is important. Um, treating your headaches and, and treating those well is, is gonna be really important to, to, again, keeping down that stroke risk. And then when unfortunately patients have strokes, thinking about them and how, uh, and how hormone replacement therapy or migraine headaches uh, may need to be addressed and managed uh, it is incredibly important. And finally, focusing on recovery and, and understanding that, you know, men and women really do have different social support and different needs during their recovery. And that's incredibly important to think about as, as, as patients are getting better, uh, but that women often will have post-stroke depression and fatigue. And we may be able to tailor to both groups uh, treatments uh, that are really able to, to be personalized to exactly the problem now that we're better understanding what's going on in the brain after stroke. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and, and I'd love to hear questions from you guys. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsh. A lot of valuable information and, and important to uh, really get to the bottom of this because there's, I think a lot of people walk around and they'll get headaches and all that and, and can get scared by it. So you've cleared up a lot of those um, questions that people might have. But before we get started, as a medical director of the Comprehensive Stroke Program at Johns Hopkins Baby Medical Center. Um, do you see, does your clinical research focus on strokes and, and outcome and recovery? The question is, do you see a gender difference and uh, differences at play in stroke prevention? So, you know, I think that uh, in general, the same, uh, the same preventative strategies are important. So seeing your primary care doctor to make sure that your blood pressure is under control and that your cholesterol is under control, that you're not smoking, that you're eating right. Those are important, whether you're a man or a woman. Some of these other things that we talked about, so out of control headaches, um, autoimmune disease um, that, that tend to affect women uh, more frequently than men are, are other opportunities to make sure that you're really keeping stroke risk down and maximizing your neurologic health. So in general, the many of the risk factors are the same, but we think about a few other additional preventative strategies for women. 
And the recovery, which you went over uh, as well, the recovery is slightly different as well between men and women. Yeah. Well, overall, it does look like the brains are are recovering from a um, from an uh, a, a mechanistic from a connectivity standpoint, very similarly, we certainly clinically see, and, and some of this is, is social factors, uh, but that women do have uh, both different symptoms with uh, respect to mood and, and fatigue, but also the support they have at home and who's able to, to help them and, and kind of rethinking that family structure. And that can make a big difference. Would it have anything to do with hormones, just in the fact, you know, women have you know, more estrogen and progesterone as opposed to, you know, men having more testosterone. Does that make a difference? That's a great question. And I don't think we've fully, fle- as far as from a recovery standpoint, I'm not sure that we've fully fleshed that out. There are definitely people that are interested in understanding the hormonal effect on recovery. We are, uh, uh, we certainly know that the neurotransmitters have an effect on recovery, although we're not exactly clear what that is either. So we know that, that the different chemicals uh, uh, certainly, um, have something to do uh, or potentially something to do with who gets better and how they get better. Um, right. But we still have a lot of work to do uh, from that front. Right. Because I, you, especially when you're talking about women, postmenopausal mm-hmm. women and stuff, and you're, you're worrying about taking hormonal replacement um, and there's, there's the good and the bad of it, right? It's Absolutely. Greatly discussed. And so hard to say, I would guess um, because yes, hormone replacement, um, I believe does, um, can help your brain, uh, function just, you know, to some degree as, as women are losing estrogen and, and, um, I've heard anyway, that women, you know, can kind of get this brain fog, you know, with lower estrogen and stuff. So that, you know, wondering if there's a connection there when, um, a woman is the estrogen is too low or something like that. No, that's a really valid. No point. estrogen, you know, minimal no, ab- estrogen. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that there's a, you know, there are people that are very interested in what happens with hormones at that at that stage also. And mm-hmm. I will say, I think you brought up a really fantastic point. You know, it, there isn't always a, a, an exact right answer. I've had many people sent to me after a stroke where they've been told that oh, you can never be on hormone replacement therapy and they're absolutely miserable. And while it is true that hormone therapy increases your stroke risk, and we absolutely have to talk about that and figure out what's right for you, Mm -hmm. being absolutely miserable and having no quality of life because of of, uh, some of the other symptoms that are affected by menopause, that, that to me is not sustainable either. So I think having that conversation, what is your stroke risk? How can we do other things to eliminate that? How can we drive that down, but keep your quality of life as good as possible? What are the other options? Those are important things. People get really scared after a stroke, which makes me happy. It's good that you're thinking about those risk factors, but we have to do it in a context where we're also thinking about other, um, other aspects of quality of life. Yeah. Quality of life. Which, got it. which leads us to this question by Lisa on, on this. So um, can you get an MRI or a CAT scan? And I know that normally they do, what is it uh, for the brain, the, not the EKGs or- Oh, an EEG. The EEG. Um, but if, if you um, are someone who happens to have headaches, um, can you get those? Like, let's say you walked in, her question is, you, know, you, get, you get it today you know, can you have a stroke tomorrow? Me, you know, meaning okay, say so they didn't find anything, but is that foolproof? You know, I think it's her question. So that's a great question. So an MRI is only a snapshot in time, right? It tells you exactly what's happening at that time. So, so the short answer is yes, but I don't want you to, to, to worry about that. What I want you to take away from that is that most headaches are benign, but it's important to, to meet with your primary care or your neurologist and to talk about your headaches and to um, most people will have migraine and, and to talk about how to get those under control when you should be concerned though, is if this is a different type of headache a terrible type of headache, the worst you've ever had. And one, it either doesn't go away or it's accompanied by other symptoms, um, especially if you've never had those symptoms before. So like I said, uh, uh, sometimes people will have migraine with aura and they'll get flashing lights or they'll get numbness in their arm and that's okay. But that 
people tend to have the same aura and they get an aura and that's their migraine and that's all right. But if you've never had symptoms with your headaches before, and all of a sudden you have symptoms, that's something that you need to contact your doctor uh, about right away. And because that's something different and well, sometimes it is just fine and migraines can change. It can also signal that there's something else going on and it's important to get to the bottom of that. So Dr. Marsh, how would you know the difference then between a stroke and an aneurysm? Oh, that's a great question. So in general, to be honest, strokes don't hurt. So what will often happen when someone has a stroke is all of a sudden their arm. Uh, so the major signs that I always tell people, uh, the, um, the easy thing uh, to think about is, is fast. If you can't remember anything else, F for face, A for arm. Um, uh, and um, so you think about weakness of the face of the arm and the leg. You think about vision, being able to see and walk and speaking, that's S, S um, in fast. And the T is time because it tells you to get to the ED. So when you have symptoms that just come on right away, um, often strokes don't hurt. Aneurysms, when they burst, blood hurts, it's irritating. It hurts the brain. And that's when you'll get the worst headache of your life. Um, uh, so again, bad headaches with neurologic symptoms could be RCVS, it could be an aneurysm. It could be a migraine and it still could be. So get it checked out so we know what the difference is. But oftentimes strokes just have symptoms and they don't have pain. Right. Thank you. Our next question, Dr. Marsh, is from Sue. And so um, can you prevent strokes? You, know, you talked about all of the, the, you list some of the possible reasons why people get strokes, but is there a way to prevent them with the obvious of, you know, um, diabetes and, you know, high blood pressure? That's a great question. So you, um, you can help to prevent them. So nothing, unfortunately, is 100% foolproof. And some of it is our is our genes. So some families are more predispositioned to have strokes than others, to get plaque in our vessels or, or, um, or to have other risk factors. But not only is it your genetic makeup in your family, but it's, it's those other risk factors. It's how you live your life, right? How much activity you do? Do you smoke? Uh, what's your weight? Um, is your blood pressure controlled, your diabetes? So while nothing is 100% foolproof, and as we get older, all of these risk factors um, you know, uh, start to accumulate a little bit, uh, at least even in healthy people, uh, just over time, uh, by keeping those risk factors under control or, or gone entirely, then you can significantly decrease your risk. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Marsh, so uh, Shantia, she'd like to know, you mentioned that there's differences in between Caucasian women and women of color, but how so? So, um, uh, in general, when we think about things like blood pressure and diabetes and kidney disease, there are some differences between uh, between Caucasians and between uh, people of color. So, for example, the different types of blood pressure medicines that work better uh, um, in in each group can be different, and the and uh, ways um, that we look for, uh, for vascular risk. So um, the important thing is that we give you a medicine that really is going to work the best for you based on your, your sex, your ethnicity, um, it, um, your genes, uh, and the risk factors that you have. So talking to your physician and figuring out kind of what your risk factors are most likely to be based on all of those things is going to be the most helpful. But there are differences uh, between uh, Blacks and whites and between women and men, uh, between Hispanics and non-Hispanics. And those are all important things to take into account as we're thinking about those risks. Right. Great. Our next question, Dr. Marsh, is from Carol. Is it typical for someone to get a stroke and then have another one immediately following it within a few days? Oh. And is the second stroke avoidable if you were to have a TPA after the first stroke? Oh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked, Carol. So it depends on the cause. So for example, if you have that vessel disease I talked about, right, and that plaque building up in, in, in your vessel, 
sometimes that can be what we call a hot carotid. So it's, there's plaque and it's unstable and you'll have your first stroke. And then a couple days later, or maybe even a couple hours later, you'll have a second stroke. That's why it's incredibly important to go right to the emergency room and to get worked up for the cause, because sometimes we can start treatments and whether that's TPA or other things that will help to prevent that second stroke from happening. Um, but, but that's a, a fantastic question. That's why one of the reasons we want you to go to the hospital so soon is so that we have the opportunity if the stroke starts small to prevent a bigger stroke or to prevent a second stroke from happening. So will strokes just continue until you get help or, or is it one, it can be two, you know, is there, is there any way that they'll just stop by themselves or do you, do you have to have That's a great, yeah, no, that's a great question too. It depends. So the the problem is, is uh, it depends on the, on the size of the blood vessel that's blocked. So when you, um, uh, clot a blood vessel, the area that it supplies starts to die and it does so in a predictable pattern, like a pool, when you drop a pebble in a pool and it slowly gets bigger and bigger. Um, And what happens is, is the longer that that blood vessel is blocked, the bigger the pool gets. So that's why if you get right to the emergency department and we get that TPA, if you're a candidate, and we open that up, you have a tiny little pool, right? A tiny little infarct. But the longer that you wait, the bigger that infarct gets, the bigger the stroke gets. And at some point it gets too big to be able to give that medicine anymore because the bigger it is, the more likely it is to bleed if blood goes back to it. And that's why we can only give TPA for the first four and a half hours. And that is why we need to get you to the emergency room quickly to see if we can get that blood vessel open so it doesn't get bigger and bigger. If you feel like you are having a stroke, did you call so if you feel like you're having or you have yep. somebody no. drive you, which, which, which so the thing you want to do is call 911. And the reason is this 911 is going to get you into the medical system. It's going to get somebody seeing you and evaluating you. They're going to be calling the hospital and talking about you and starting treatment. And you're going to be rolling into that hospital and there's going to be people ready to help you and to do things. If you, unfortunately, even if you can drive faster than the ambulance, you, <laughs> then you have to go into the emergency room right? Um, Then you have to register and do all of these things. And that all takes precious time. Uh, It's also probably not safe for you or anybody with you to be behind the wheel trying to get you to the hospital when so much is going on. So Mm -hmm. call 911, let people start evaluating, let them start talking and to kind of put those wheels in motion to get you treatment fast. Very good. Very, very good point. Um, Dr. Marshall, next question is from Rachel. She'd like to know, are there particular stroke risks for women that have low blood pressure? We always talk about high. What about low blood pressure? That's a good question. That is a good question. So usually, um, fortunately, low blood pressure um, doesn't, uh, doesn't carry the same risk as high blood pressure over time. Sometimes what can happen, though, is that, um, remember, your brain t- needs blood flow right? So uh, if the blood pressure is too low, then uh, then that's why you feel dizzy and sometimes pass out because that then you lay, lay flat and, and the brain's getting what it needs. Um, if over time you develop any kind of plaque or stenosis and there's not enough blood flow, then that potentially could be a risk factor for stroke. Uh, but usually the low blood pressure doesn't do this, doesn't have the same effect on the blood vessels that the high does. And normally people with lower blood pressure tend to um, do things like uh, syncopize or, or pass out as opposed to having uh, uh, strokes. Mm-hmm. Good, good point. Um, okay, our next question, Dr. Morris, is from Kimberly, and she'd like to know if you've had a prior brain aneurysm, are you more at risk for a stroke? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, not usually. So you um, uh, usually um, a, a brain aneurysm. So what an aneurysm is uh, for people that are wondering is, right, vessels are a long tube, but sometimes there can be a weakness in the blood vessel wall and you get this little out pouching. Um, and that out pouching isn't as strong. That wall isn't as strong as the tube. So it can be a place that can rupture or burst. And we talked about how blood in the brain isn't good. It, it, it's, it's irritating, it hurts, and it causes dysfunction. Um, so typically, if you have an aneurysm and that's treated, um, it, that's a different uh, mechanism than, than stroke itself. Every so often, an aneurysm can get clot in it that can cause strokes, but that's a much more rare occurrence. Usually, fortunately, they are um, 
they're unrelated. Now, when you get a lot of blood in your head, uh, if the blood vessel bursts with an aneurysm, sometimes the blood vessels can do something called spasm. And that can result in a stroke, but that happens in the initial phase uh, when, when there's a lot of blood and in, in, in the emergency setting, not in the longer term after your aneurysm has been treated and just thinking about your stroke risk in general. Mm -hmm. So on another note with that, can you have a heart attack and a stroke at the same time? Like, how do you know the, the difference? Oh, that's a wonderful or, question. Or not only know the difference, but can you actually have the same thing at the same time? Yeah, so you can do that in a couple of ways, actually. So one, uh, one can cause the other. Um, so when, um, so the brain is really smart. That's why I like it. It likes to be the boss. And if the brain isn't getting enough blood flow, what it says to the heart is, do a better job, and it ramps up your blood pressure. Sometimes really high. So I don't know if any of you have ever, unfortunately, had a stroke and gone into the emergency room and had your blood pressure be 180 or 200 or higher, and that's because your brain is saying, "I I don't have enough blood. Please up it." Well, you can imagine the strain that puts on the heart, and we've absolutely seen. Usually, they're mild. They're strain on the heart, and and they're taken care of uh, with with conservative management. But sometimes, if people have you know, uh, bad cardiac disease, which if they have bad vessels in their head, they sometimes will have bad vessels in their heart too. They can have heart attacks. The other way they can be related is the opposite way. Whereas if you have a heart that's sick and isn't pumping well and has a heart attack, it can throw a clot to the brain too. That's less common, but certainly happens. Um, but, but yes, the, the two can be related. Fortunately, we don't see that a lot, but, but it is something we certainly look for. You know, we you hear sometimes in the news about, you know, when you're talking about throwing clots mm -hmm. and if someone goes in and even if they're just going under for surgery, right, under anesthesia and um, and then you, you hear, you know, they they've thrown a clot. Mm -hmm. What what is the particular reason for something yeah. like that? Great question. So what can happen is. Um, Remember, so, so a couple of things. So one, when you're going under surgery, again, the body's really smart. So just like pregnancy, it doesn't like it when it's going to be bleeding, right? So it makes the blood thick when it, because uh, um, when you cut into something, you want to not be bleeding out. So you want the blood to be a little thick. So the body has kind of increased its coagulation in general during surgery. But then what also can happen is, is surgery is a stress on the body and that can predispose people to something called atrial fibrillation or arrhythmias. So that when your body's undergoing surgery, your heart, rather than beating, it kind of shakes and it goes boom. But boom, boom, boom. So your pulse isn't regular. And what happens is, is without that nice, uh, consistent beating, clots can build up and go to the brain. And that is a way that you can get a stroke during that perioperative period, that, that, that period of surgery. Um, so those are the two most common, either the blood itself is, is, is kind of a little bit thicker because of surgery or because you have an arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation during the procedure. The nice thing you're being monitored at that time. So they're hopefully right on top of it. And, you know, yeah, that's, we absolutely, when they uh, we absolutely will go back and look at those records and say, Oh, did we see an arrhythmia? What's going on? Uh, absolutely. So that kind of goes into our next question um, from Renee, who's saying, so, so if you have AFib, is this a precursor for a stroke? Ah, wonderful question. Thanks for asking. So the answer is, is it, is, is it certainly is a risk factor and it needs to be modified. Um, so what do I mean by that? So the good news is, is there's lots of, of potential treatments and you should talk to your doctor about whether aspirin or a, or a more strong blood thinner. So you might've seen advertisements on TV for the DOAX for things like a Pixaban or a Zeralto um, or Warfarin. Uh, so deciding with your doctor based on your other risk factors, which of those is, is the best for you will help to minimize your risk of having a stroke. But yes, atrial fibrillation is absolutely a stroke risk factor. Interesting. So, <clears throat> so if you know you have that, Mm -hmm. You obviously tell your primary care physician, so they're staying on top of that. Mm -hmm. so, so should everyone take a small dose of aspirin if you're over the age of 45? Ah, that's a, that is the hot question of, of, uh, of, the, <laughs> this, of this year. Um, so it used to be that we thought not too long ago, as in like maybe six to 12 months, <laughs> that uh, we used to say that if you were over 65, 
and you were a man, that an aspirin a day was good for your heart. And if you were a woman, an aspirin a day was good for your brain. So greater than 65, everybody's on an aspirin. Lately, what's come out is that, you know, while that is true, there, it, it, there is a benefit. At the same time, aspirin isn't totally benign, right? You can have GI upset, you can have some bleeding. Uh, so there is risk involved. So then it becomes, okay, what's the risk benefit? So from my perspective as a stroke doctor, if you've had a stroke, then yes, you need an aspirin or something equivalent. That's very different. But for someone who's never had any of those, just being 65 does not mean that you need to be on an aspirin. Is there a downside to being on the aspirin? Because um, I would yeah. think most people when they, I know my friends, when they hear, I mean, everybody say, I take an aspirin a day, you know, I think, you know, and, but you know, is there a down, down other than, other than that it might hurt your stomach, but any other so you, there is potentially the increased risk. So some people have bleeding in their, they'll either have bleeding in their stool or they'll have bleeding in their urine. So you can have some increased bleeding risk with aspirin. Um, so uh, those are the main, the main complications that I think about. It's not usually bleeding in the brain. Thank goodness. It's usually in, in, again, in your, um, in your stool or in your urine. Um, but, uh, but yes, it's, there's at least enough bleeding risk that it makes you think about whether or not an aspirin is right for you. And again, talking to your primary care about the risk factors that you have for cardiovascular disease and for stroke and deciding whether an aspirin is right for you. But in general, um, not everyone is going on an aspirin. It, it used to be, again, kind of, I'm 65, an aspirin it is. And, that, and that's just not the case anymore. Right. And, and also, you, you're, you know, between social media and what's on TV, all the advertisements, all this and that, I mean, you just don't know anymore. I know. I mean, you really There's don't a lot know of information. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important. One, why we're doing these webinars and talking to a professional here, um, that it really is important to um, go to your primary care, or even if you, you know, if you don't have a primary care, go to a, you know, a patient first, uh, you know, type of uh, place, but someone that, you know, that you're telling them, these are the medications I'm on and the, and the importance of all of that and, and just so cross-referencing and all that, as opposed to, you know, I hear so many say, oh no, I'm taking this because I read it, you know, I heard about it on, on the news or on social media. And, um, you know, to your point that, you know, it's just very dangerous. I, you know, I would think that you just don't know. And it is. And it is. How do you know what's good information? I mean, there's so much out there. How do you know what to listen to and what not? It, you know, it's 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 good, it's bad. It's it's like those commercials they used to have for milk, right? It, milk, it's good for you. It's not good for you. I don't know if it's good for me or not. Um, and and that's kind of what's happened with with aspirin. So absolutely having that conversation with your with your primary care or your neurologist is is a great idea. Uh, again, many people benefit from an aspirin, and and it can help with a lot of different cardiovascular and and stroke risk. But making sure that it's the right medicine for you to be on is also a good idea. Sure. Great. Thank you very much. Dr. Marsh Barber would like to know, would it be obvious to providers that the patient has had a stroke during surgery? And uh, I know of patients whose stroke was not identified until family noticed symptoms after surgery. I suppose anything, anything's possible. Yeah. So that's a great question, Barbara. So, you know, during the, um, the problem is, is that when you're waking someone up right from surgery, sometimes they can be groggy and, and yes, hy hypothetically, you should see, right. Like we talked about that weakness or slurring of speech, but sometimes as people are waking up, it, you know, you wake up a little bit funny. And, and so it's not always readily apparent. And, and sometimes it does take that family member to say, he's not talking right. And then to realize it's not because anesthesia is still going on. It's because there's something else going on. So usually those things are, are caught, but it's always good to be an, an advocate for, uh, uh, for the person that you're with and making sure that you're asking those questions. If you're concerned that there could be something. Of course. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Marsh, a question from Anne. What's an example of a brain activity that exercises the mindfulness you're looking for? That's a great, ex a great question. So what is the best activity to do for your brain? Like, we don't know, but what I can, what I'll tell you what I do know, what I do know is the brain is like anything else, right? Think about if you don't go to the gym for a month or more, right? The body gets lazy. So does the brain. So COVID was really bad for our brains because everybody was in their house by themselves themselves 
isolated and not engaging, not doing things, right? Um, I can't tell you the number of people that have come to me with thinking problems because they've been alone for the last two years, right? So anything that you do that engages your brain is better than nothing. And what I tell people is, listen, I can tell you to do Sudoku, or I can tell you to try mindfulness, or I can tell you to do all these things, but I want you to pick something, one that's challenging for you. So what are you having trouble with? And set that as a goal to do better. And two, something you're going to do, because if I assign you something and you hate it so much, you never want to do it and you don't do it, that's no good for you. So picking something that's challenging enough, but that you enjoy doing and doing that um, is, is both good for you know goal-directed behavior and feeling like you accomplished something, but also, again, engaging that brain and getting it working. And that's the most important thing. We don't have the fantastic, uh, I'm working on it, but we don't have the fantastic mm-hmm. answer exactly what that best pill is, what that best magic, magic treatment is. But right now we know it's, it's engaging the brain and doing something. And that, that would be nice coming up with that, but who will one day? We'll work on it. <laughs> so I would imagine then um, going into our next question and, um, but from Jenny is, you know, how important is sleep to prevent stroke? So sleep is important both to prevent stroke, but also in stroke recovery. So I talked about engagement, but I should also talk about rest. So right after a stroke, the brain is part of that fatigue that people have. I really believe is because the brain's trying really hard to to recover, right? And that's exhausting. So you have to work it, right? You have to exercise it, but you also have to rest it. So sleep is incredibly important in that recovery period. But it's also important to your point in, you know, it, we know good sleep um, uh, is, is important in, uh, to, to maintain good health in general, right? So um, sleep apnea is the thing that we think about the most. Uh, so when people um, have obstructive sleep apnea and, and they, um, they stop breathing at night or, or they have a lot of snoring, uh, that can actually be a stroke risk factor. It strains the heart. Um, so it's not necessarily the, oh, I'm up all night, although that's not good for you, right? That causes catecholamines and stress. But when I think about sleep problems, as far as prevention, I think about obstructive sleep apnea. Right. And, and, well, and Dr. Not- Marsh, I, I hate to cut you off, oh, but you're at that I go over time. No, no, we're at that <laughs> eight o'clock hour. And, um, but I want to thank Dr. Marsh so much. Thank you for speaking with us this evening. A lot of wonderful information. And she's graciously agreed to respond to any of the unanswered questions. So you'll receive an email in a couple of weeks with uh, outlining the questions and answers. So in the coming weeks uh, ahead, also a video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash A Woman's Journey under videos on demand. And if you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey for more information about upcoming webinars, our insights that matter podcast series, and sign up for our monthly email. Thank you for joining us. Good night and stay well.